2つ目のテーマは、えー、学部教育ですね、えー、が対象になってますけれども、まあ、我が国でも、国公私立大学でさまざまなです、ねえー、学部教育の改革というものが行われていますけれども、同じくアメリカの大学でも、えー、各校、それぞれ独自にですね、えー、新しい取り組みを、えー、模索しながらですね、えー、展開されているということで。あのペリベーカー先生はですね、今は、えー、副学長の立場で、えー、学部テキサス大学公式以降の、えー、新しいですね、学部教育のあり方を、えー、検討する、えー、ディレクターになっておられます。ということで、えー、そういう学校教育、特に大学高等教育における、今、取り組んでおられることをですね、えー、お話しいただこうと思います。えー
But you type it, you type what you see in the picture. At the end of your time, you push the submit button and it analyzes your language and gives you feedback about your personality. And I ended up playing with this and writing various programs to analyze different other types of natural text. And it occurred to me, you know, you can actually set this up so you could have two people interacting online and the computer can analyze the language of the two people and it gives the people feedback about the way they're talking to each other. It's, it's a very simple uh, jump to do that. So I had an undergraduate student who was in computer science to help with this and he wrote the program and it worked. So we could have the two people talking and it, after a few minutes the computer could say to one of them, hey, you said 80% of all the words in the last few minutes Try to pull back and get the other person to talk more. Or we had metrics so we could tell if the two people are paying attention to each other. And we could get, give them feedback. You all don't seem to be paying attention to each other in this conversation. Or we could give them feedback about the emotional tone of the conversation or if they were staying on task. And many want to do this. And then it occurred to me, what if we, instead of two people, what if we had five people in the interaction, a small group, and we did the same thing? We have the computer just monitoring what each person is saying, and then we can give either the entire group feedback or individuals in the group feedback about their group dynamics. My friend, my student, wrote that the program, it worked very well. And then I was wondering, I wonder, what if we took this to our introductory psychology class? And we had all 500 students uh, bring their laptop to, to class. And we break the, the class into groups of, of five people. So we would get 100 groups of five people. And we could give them all feedback. So the first question is, would this even work? So I contacted people at the university and to find out if our Wi-Fi system could handle this, and we tested it out, and it worked. And it was really, really interesting. So imagine there are 500 people here, you all have your laptop, and you're talking to four other people in the room, and you don't even know who they are. And every now and then, when we were first doing this, we'd be watching, and all of a sudden, there'd be five people would stick their hands up across the, the room, and they were people who were in the same group trying to figure out who they were talking to. Well, after doing this, we started to realize the, the promise of this. What if we had students bring a laptop to class every day, and we could have them fill out questionnaires in class and give them feedback immediately about their questionnaire? What if we had quizzes on their laptops on, uh, every day, or and we? So that we didn't have to have, you know, a, a test that we would pass out in class and fill out a scantron back then. What if, and we started thinking of these other possibilities. So the next semester, working with the university, we started to develop a fairly elaborate system so that students, in fact, started to, uh, things started to change. We required students to bring a laptop to class every day. But unlike the way that we had taught before, and by the way, we, the way we had taught before was we had students come in and there'd be four tests over the course of the semester. And generally, they were multiple choice tests. So we, shift, we shifted this to deciding to have, we would have a test every day at the beginning of every class. And the, the test, there would be eight questions on the test. Seven of them would be from the previous lecture and previous readings. And one question would be based on some question that they had missed in the past, but it would not be the same question. It would be conceptually similar. Now, we can appreciate this at the time, but we had stumbled across a, a strategy 
that was really smart because it relied on repeated testing. And it, we no longer had uh, four tests in the class. We no longer had a final. We just had these tests over the course of the semester. First of all, students always came to class. We never had people missing class, so very, very rarely. Secondly, students liked it. Third, we got rid of the textbook. We just threw out the textbook and made all of our readings from online sources. And these could be from Wikipedia, they could be from, they could be um, YouTubes, they could be almost anything. But the nature of the, the, the nature of it was everything was on their computer. And by the way, students did not have to spend $150 for a book because it was no book. So, and we also were able to break the class down into small chat groups every day. And, and, by the way, we got data on everything. We got every word they wrote. We got, every, we got everything. So, the, we did need the class, and it seemed to work pretty well. Our course ratings were a little bit lower that first time, but I discovered that it's always true if you change the class. But what was most striking was we went through afterwards and we analyzed how students did on specific questions. With this new approach, students uh, did about one letter grade better than students in our earlier classes. Now, we didn't know this because we didn't know how to curve our grades, but students were objectively performing better. Secondly, we started to track how students were doing and we there were certain things we discovered in terms of how they were performing in the course because they could draw for their lowest tests. We discovered that students who took our class actually did better in their other classes that same semester. Almost as though they were learning how to study, how to take conceptually difficult test questions. And students who took our class that semester did better in the classes they took the next semester as well. And this is controlling for their aptitude tests, controlling for everything that you can imagine. But one thing that was particularly interesting, in the United States, and I would bet a huge amount of money is true in Japan as well, that students their first year of college that there are big differences in how they perform as a function of their social class. If students' parents both went to college, they do better in college their first year than do students who, who neither parent went to college. And it's a really strong effect. It's historically been at least one letter grade. What we discovered was that with this new method, we reduced this disparity from about one letter grade, as we had found in previous years, to about 0.3 or 0.4 letter grades. In other words, we're reducing the disparity between upper middle and lower middle class students. And the students who took our class, that, that these lower middle class students were performing at middle class levels, and they continue to perform at these higher levels in the later classes that they took. This is phenomenal. So here we were teaching 1,000 students. Uh, the, the students were performing much better, and it was a, it, it was a really interesting kind of new taking advantage of technology. So we decided to move to an online class the next semester. And we used a method that we call, uh, it's like a MOOC, but it's, we're calling it a SMOC, a synchronous massive online class. And what we would do is the next semester, or the next year when we taught it, we broadcast it out to about 1,500 students. And it, it was live, so the class always met at, say, 3.30 in the afternoon, two days a week. And we, we experimented with the techniques. But we, uh, the first thing we realized that a traditional stand-up lecture would, did not work. Online classes, by the way, at least in the United States, have a very bad reputation. And they have a bad reputation because they're really boring. And the way, the reason is, is that traditionally, 
they are done like the camera back there. So the camera back there, if this were a, a traditional online class, it would be broadcast and people would look at this at the video and you'd see on your TV screen, here's this screen, and right here in the middle at the bottom is the guy who's giving the lecture. And it's it's just boring. And so we started paying attention to television. What does television do to make things appealing? And part of it, we were very much influenced by late night television. And so we changed it so that Sam and I would sit behind a desk and we would talk to each other sometimes. We would have what we call fake news. So we have a section of this called Psychology in the News. And what this would be would be a recent finding from some journal article. But one of us would be in some fake location. Sometimes we, uh, one of us would be standing on a cliff somewhere because it was a green screen. Or in a balloon. Or we did one where one of us is hanging from a building while, while we, we are talking about children's fear of heights or things like that. And then we would and then we'd break the class into segments, and each segment would never be more than four to six minutes. In some segments, we, we would always have an expert come in, and we would interview them. The point is, is we started to realize that television understands people's focus of attention. Well, this method also worked really well, and all of a sudden, the the scale problem, the scale issue, became really interesting because. If we can teach 1,500 people at the same time, all of a sudden, we don't need as many faculty to teach introductory psychology. And the, the faculty who, who would have been teaching that many students now can teach other psychology classes with fewer people in them. We also started to deal with the issue of teaching assistants. Typically, if you teach a class of 100 students, you get a teaching you get a, a TA, an under, a graduate or undergraduate student who helps. We were able to get by with just five TAs for 1,500, and they were used almost exclusively for making quit, test quizzes or quizzes for each class. Students stopped using, because we discovered that we, this was effective, we discovered the reason it was effective was because we were using repeated testing. It turns out, if you go through the entire education literature, and I would urge you to do this if you're interested in education, you will, you will be horrified at the state of education science. Hardly anything works. The one thing that you can take to the bank that actually does work is repeated testing. The more you test people, the better they do, and the more they learn. Now, it turns out we've known this for the last 30 years, but nobody's done it because it's so much work. However, once you move to scale, once you move to a very large class, you can actually do the repeated testing because you can get a group of people who can help with the class. So the next year, they built a TV studio for us. And in the TV studio, they decided, the university started to realize this is actually really smart. And they got another class, a government class, to do the same thing. And then the semester after that, they got another, uh, another type of government class, and then a history class, and then a chemistry class. And now there are about 17 classes that the university is doing online. Now, as I got immersed in this, because this was our class at the beginning, I started dealing with different parts of the university bureaucracy, because there are some very interesting problems dealing with these giant classes. One is, is how do you deal with TAs? How do you deal with faculty low? In other words, we ended up doing so much work. It, it wasn't fair that we would have to teach as much as other faculty, and but how do you get a university to agree to that? Uh, how do you deal with cheating as that occurs? How do you deal with all of these problems? And I started spending lots of times with the university bureaucracy, 
dealing with issues with our graduate training, our undergraduate training, our student services, advising. It turns out that students in our class, our class is famous for being one of the most difficult classes. These students uh, didn't go, didn't seek help the way that our previous students had because we started to realize that we could actually find out what students were having problems with and create videos specifically for the problem, problems that were having in class. As all of this was going, I started to spend time with some education experts, both at the University of Texas and elsewhere, and started to, to be, begin thinking, what's going on with our educational system? Now, I don't know if this is going on in Japan, but in the United States right now, there is a huge discussion. And the complaints are, we are now spending a lot of money on education. There's not good evidence that, that people are getting a better education. Why is it costing so much? And there's all sorts of reasons why. We have all this new technology. Everything is different. Why aren't we taking better advantage of it? And how can we start looking at the science behind education to see what really works? There's another interesting problem. We are stuck in an educational model that's a hundred that's hundreds of years old and it doesn't make any sense anymore for example at my university we have a semester system you have a semester system as well for us the semesters goes from middle of january to the middle of may and then from the end of august to the first part of december that's the way it is well why why, why, do, why can't we have a class that goes from, you know, October 14th to December 20th? Well, we're told, you can't do that because our computer system doesn't allow it. You have to teach during this time period. We have three-hour classes. Three-hour classes meaning students are in, in, the, in classrooms roughly three hours a week. Why? Where on earth does it say that classes have to be three hour in three hour blocks? The reason we teach these three hour blocks is because of the way a university is built. Though Shisha University was built the same way my university was, which was a group of people sat around thinking, okay, let's build a university. And then they said, well, how many students do we want to have come? And then somebody said, okay, let's start off, let's have a thousand students. Then they got some people around saying, okay, if we have three-hour classes and we go for this semester, uh, how many classrooms do we need? In other words, you build a classroom around the number of students. Well, if you're teaching a class that no longer has classrooms, all of a sudden, everything changes. And why have three-hour classes? Why not have a one-hour class? Well, your university says, we don't have one-hour classes because we have never had one-hour classes. Uh, but, okay, how about a 0.5-hour class? Imagine this. Most of you are in psychology. I will bet that you have some rules about what classes you need to take to take an upper division class. Well, you have to have statistics. And then you go look at these upper division classes. You're taking a clinical class. Do you really need statistics for that? Of course you don't. You do need, you might need to know what a correlation is. Why not have a 0.5 hour class on correlation? Why, why have a full three hour class on statistical methods, frankly, aren't even used much anymore? The point is, is why don't we break out of our ways of thinking? Because we can. Now, if there is a high-level administrator at this university, that administrator will say, well, that's a great idea, but we have a computer that's called the Student Information System that your university probably installed many years ago. My university installed ours in the 1970s. We have the same registration system now that we had in the 1970s. Hardly anybody even knows how to program it. But it was built on the assumption that classes 
went a semester, and the unit of analysis was class, not student. In the, only in the last five to ten years have we started changing computer programs to allow a much more flexible registration system that allows for classes that don't require space, that allows for classes that could be a 0.5 hour or one hour or 3.6 hour classes. And there are bureaucratic hassles that are horrifying. So these issues were starting to really bug me. Why can't we change university to make education more efficient? to make it more flexible, allowing more online classes that are really high quality so that we can redefine what a course is, what a curriculum is, what a calendar is, and finally, what a student is. In other words, why not, if you're teaching a class that actually does have an online component, why not broadcast it out to students elsewhere in the country? Or if, for that matter, anywhere on earth that they could take the course and it would be just as good course for them as it would be for a student like here at Doshisha. Your university says, well that goes against our tradition. We, you know, we, we really care about our students here. Well yeah, 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 that's beautiful. But there's no reason you couldn't, you couldn't do it uh, because you, what you would be doing is re expanding the reach of high quality education here at Doshisha. Now, as I've gotten into this, some of the other questions are, why not have, and by the way, I'm not arguing that all classes should be online, they shouldn't. But there's some ways of, te of harnessing technology that can make it so that students can have experiences they couldn't have otherwise. Let's say you want to take a a language class. Let's say you want to take an English class that would be uh, that would be with people in a, uh, an area of an area of psychology in the United States. Let's say let's say you wanted to come and learn some English and take a particular class on language in, in my lab. Hey, sorry, I don't have the space right now, but we can create a class an online class where I have, in fact, I did this last semester. I taught a one-hour course on text analysis, and it was a graduate class of about eight people at my university. And then I broadcast it out to another 10 people around the world. We all met at the same time. We used the, the, the equivalent of Skype, and it was like a small discussion group. Everybody participated. But it, and we, we have the technology now, and there's some methods that are smarter than Skype for, for a class like that. So I started talking with the, the, the heads of my university, and in, including the president. And we agreed, you know, the university is changing. And this, universities are changing all over the world. Why don't we see, start to bring about these changes at, at our university? And to bring about change in a university means you have to change the very bureaucracy, the very infrastructure of a university. Meaning, to bring about the changes I've just been telling you about requires, first of all, the change in the way that our registration system works, our central computer system. It means it has to change the financial models of our university. It means we have to change rules and regulations that our state and the university and the federal government have for scholarships, for credit, for everything. It means that we have to change advising. It means we have to change the curricula from department to department. It means we have to change basically everything for a university. Now, those of you who are young are probably living under the illusion that the vanguard of change is a university. And that's what we tell you, that we, we are educating you to change the world. And we are. <coughs> but don't try to change us, because we have been teaching this way since Socrates, and Socrates didn't have an iPhone. You know, maybe we shouldn't have iPhones in the classroom either. 
The reality is, is that faculty are very conservative. And to bring about change above all, we need to bring about change in the way faculty think. So, in talking to the university, we agreed that I would create a new office. It's called Project 2021. And Project 2021 is an office that we, I had about 200 people working for me. And I am answerable to the president and to the provost, or the vice president. And, but I'm not in a traditional line of command. And I'm working to bring about a basic structural change at the university. Now, I'm telling you about this because it is incredibly exciting and also horrifying because it's so, so complex. But the problems that we're dealing with at the University of Texas, there are people here at Doshisha that are worrying about these issues as well. And they're worrying about it at every other university on Earth. And if they're not worrying about it, uh, that university is not going to be around very long because the changes are coming. Today, Professor Yogo took me around to the library and the, the learning commons. And this is, this is where you can tell where a university is starting to think in a more forward way. The learning commons here are really smart. You go in there and it's packed with students who are actively involved with one another. You go to the library and at my university what has essentially happened is our library has become our learning commons. And so they've gotten rid of half of the books and, and they're getting rid of most of the rest of the books. They, they don't know what to do with them because nobody on earth wants hard copy books much. And instead, they're, they're shipping them to another place where people can go and get them. But the reality is, is most of those books, they're converting to digital format so that students always have access to them. But the point is, is the whole definition of a library has changed. That, and even your library, I was looking, so you have places where people are there in the stacks or in the area with books. Or, but how do any of them actually have a book? on their table, they have papers, they have their iPhone, they have their computers and so forth. But the point is, if they have all these other spaces that are just like the Learning Commons area. But what's happening is, this is the new world. This is the way students are learning. This is the way we as faculty are writing papers now. I just wrote a book, and this is a, a book I'm very proud of. And I didn't go to a library. I mean, this is horrifying. Can you imagine writing a scholarly book and never going to a library? Why go to a library? I've got Wikipedia. I have access to every online journal imaginable. I have access to everything. And the way that we're using information is something that is, you know, we all know it. But now we're having to rethink what the hard university is. Now, what this is going to mean, your children are eventually going to go to universities that will not meet all the time. Perhaps they will come to the university, they will spend months here, and then and spend time collaborating, working with others, and then they'll spend time elsewhere. Mostly. The fact is, is the models for education are, are being, we are all starting to test what works, what doesn't. And now for me, how do you bring about this change? And it's been, the, it, it's been very interesting. Over the course of my career, I've had many, many topics that I've studied. This is the most complex, horrifying project I've ever been involved with. It's called Project 2021 because the goal is to change the university in five years, and then my office will just disappear and the changes that I hope we are able to bring about will be uh, in force. So that is Project 2021, the beginning of the future of education, maybe, or maybe I'll just be fired very quickly because nobody wants it, although I don't think that's going to happen. So I'm open for any questions, if you have any questions about kind of this new world order. Thank you very much.
えー、と2021年に向けての、えー、教育改革、学校教育の改革で、まあ、今、ラーニングコモンズとかですね、ライブラリーの話も出てきましたけれども、えー、何か皆さんの方で、さらにこうちょっと聞いてみたいこととかありますか、特に学校生の方で、大学がこういうふうになればいいのになとか、アイディアがあれば。Thank you for your speech.、Uh, my question is Is the uh, project like the、uh, uh, 2021 project is common in、uh, the United States? No. no?、Um, at other major universities, they are working on certain parts of what we're doing.、Um, and there's, there are a couple of places that are, that are, I think, ahead of us. But we're at, at the vanguard of this, I think. Uh, how do you、uh, think that、uh, this kind of project will be I mean,、uh, not just、uh, in our own university but、uh, in the future?、Uh, is, uh, is that going to be a、uh, uh, Or just... So that's a, that's a very good question. There, I think there's no question that all universities will be changing fairly radically. One example we're moving to this、uh, part, what I'm calling fractional credit, so that a course can be 1.5 hours or 0.5 hours. Right now, there's a small number of schools that actually have, you can do it, but it's not easy. And the, the federal government has problems with it because of the way that, that the federal government is able to fund students. But the federal government now realizes it's going to have to change. So, what that means is this change, this subtle, it's a kind of a quiet, subtle change, is coming because everybody sees it. The same thing is true in terms of、um, how classrooms are used and online classes. It's going to change. And it's going to change here, it's going to change everywhere because everybody sees this kind of Will all places be like the University of Texas? No. Every place is going to create their own hybrid system, and they always have. And the University of Texas will be doing a million experiments. And two thirds of them will fail. But this is the nature, this is, we're talking evolution. This is, you know, we, we don't know what's going to work, but by doing all sorts of testing and building all of this with some science underneath it, I think that is what will make the big difference. Thank you very much. For your talk,、uh, that is actually a timely topic、uh, for us. So,、uh, indeed, the Japanese Ministry of Education and Science is currently trying to reform or reconstruct the education system in universities. And、uh, especially, I think,、uh, the new technologies, including computer networking, should be introduced to education more and more. So, We must accept it immediately.、Uh, for example, last year I gave a, a lecture uh, in a, a graduate school of integrated research、uh, as a guest professor. That university is a very excellent research oriented institute. So、uh, that was a kind of online education. I mean,、uh, I gave lectures in Okazaki, in the IT prefecture, but the、uh, student joined to the class、uh, in many branches all around Japan, from Hokkaido to Okinawa Island. And uh, uh, in that university,、uh, all courses are delivered in English. So, and uh, uh, all textbooks and materials are in network. 
So I think uh, that the example of new education, what I uh, said. So, and uh, my impression was basically positive. Yeah, that I think uh, that worked very well. Uh, but, uh, however, I uh, bit felt ambitious because I'm an uh, old person and uh, I have a uh, sort uh, of strategy uh, for the face to face uh, classic style uh, education. But uh, anyway, uh, I think that that was good, and uh, we must uh, be we must be uh, familiar with such new style of education. And uh, well, uh, and also uh, my university, the main university, is uh, changing uh, the university education system. Uh, for example, next year uh, we will adopt a uh, quarter semester system. So, maybe as you know, uh, most Japanese universities have a uh, two semester system. So, uh, my university will change to the quarter. Uh, I don't know how if that new system will be successful or not, but uh, yeah, uh, we are. We are uh, in the big change, uh, also in Japan. It's, you know, it's interesting, this issue of are we losing the face-to-face -face experience for students? No, I think that the future of education will always have kind of this apprenticeship model because I've become educated about uh, what parents, what students, and what employers want to hire. And you know, they want to hire people who can collaborate. Well, collaboration requires working closely with others. They want people who are savvy in terms of at least digital technology. They want people who can know something about leadership. They need to know, that the person has to know how to write. And so some of these basic skills do in fact require kind of a more uh, involved kind of uh, ability. But then others, you know, many of the things in terms of just learning the basic information, that, that can be delivered in a much more distant kind of way. And tutoring, and some tutoring, I mean, there's all sorts of tutoring that can be done both online and not. But it is true that the world is changing, and going from a, a semester system to a quarter system will be a good, good practice. I, I actually don't. I hope that they both go away, <laughs> frankly, and that things are just are becoming a little bit more flexible.
And part of what we need to be doing is to really instilling a greater sense of connectedness with other students, with the school, with the teachers, etc. So you see the, uh, the new method is a way to increase the belongingness to the school community. Mm -hmm. I think that the belongingness uh, is related to uh, students' adjustment to it school is. too. It is. Yeah, and uh, I'm very much agree with you that that uh, students should develop the sense of they have to, have to get used to the new technology. But uh, I was, I, at the same time, I also have a worry that uh, um, if students are very young, then um, if they're encouraged to use like um, laptop and iPad and iPhone to learn it, um, they might cause uh, addiction problem too. It's very, very hard to draw the line for the parents to produce TV. And you know, I view all of these as empirical questions, you know, questions that we can put to science and see how much is true. You know, this idea of kids being addicted to their electronic devices, these are probably the same kids who were, who were in my generation, were, were addicted to, to the telephone, to talking to others, and who in my parents' generation were addicted just to sneaking out behind the barn to smoke a cigarette and because they like to talk with other people all the time. In other words, it's not, I'm not sure it's the electronic devices that rather it might be just the people themselves who, who just have to be connected all the time. But these are, you know, these are all empirical questions. We can start finding out what really is mattering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, well, two comments. Um, one is about, uh, I like the idea that you want, um, students to bring their laptop and uh, chatting and discussing uh, online with each other. And I think it will be very, uh, very effective in the time because students are not, sometimes they're shy to, to impress, uh, impress their ideas. Mm -hmm. So it will be very helpful in class, I think. I, I, and we're actually we're finding that as well, is that mm -hmm. uh, students who often are very shy in class when it's when the discussions are online, they are those same kids are now very much involved in the conversations. Yeah, yeah, great. And I have another uh, comment or question about uh, like this technology uh, using in in clinical psychology. Is myself being an uh, uh, international student in Japan. Uh, we don't have much uh, mental health support here, so I'm trying to. Um, uh, to develop uh, like ICPT, the internet um, CPT uh, intervention for international students in Japan. And uh, from the perspective of language and technology using, do, do you see any future of this? I think there's a huge future in this. And I've been horrified in my university. We got very smart clinicians clinical psychologists, and from other universities as well, there is no discussion to speak of about internet therapy. And that's insane. It's a perfect medium. It's being done a lot in Germany. And Germany, I think, is one of the most creative groups. But right now, in, at least in the United States, we're not doing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, I, I don't see much about this. Mm -hmm. Too much development about this. I think one of the reasons is because I get similar with the education because they both education and also clinical psychologists they have very high pride of this, um, the themselves to go on to be uh, to take on grades. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, now this starts to mess with with so many rules and regulations uh, and it it's all, it's all economic.
for me, uh, it's very important and uh, direction of the educating system. So, what well, I'd like to ask you for now, what do you think about the possible problem of your direction, such as the uh, range student doesn't uh, log in or uh, ask for progress test, uh, cluster faculty don't do that system? Well, the way that we're dealing with change is we're essentially going to the university because I suspect this is also true nation worldwide <coughs> academics. You cannot bring about change from the top down. You know, every university has tried to do this. Getting the university, the faculty to do this or that. We're not going to do it. We do whatever we want. However, and that's why you know I'm I'm coming in with this guerrilla movement, which is going to departments and departments saying. Here's an option. Here's some things you can do. It'll do this. It'll do this. You don't want to do it? That's great. In fact, I prefer you not do it because then I'll have more resources for other departments. And so, this is psychology. Welcome to <laughs> cognitive dissonance. I think it's a very good feeling. How many years did you um, try to prepare that musical? Oh, well, this. This, the job that I'm in now started in January, so I, this has just started, and um, I'll be honest, I never even thought about what education was until we did our first online class about five years ago. So this is this is new for me. Thanks so much. Well, uh, I have a. Great question. Uh, someone say, uh, even professors and teachers might be replaced by artificial intelligence in the future. Uh, I think uh, that remark might be too happy. So uh, my question is, how much and how do you think the human factor is important in education? Boy, is that a great question. I just came uh, the reason I'm in Japan is there is an international convention of multimodal something that is essentially dealing a lot with artificial intelligence across all parts of life. And I, you know, on one level it's incredibly exciting, and another it's very, very creepy. And you know, I'm very interested in this question. For example. To what degree can we give people feedback so they can become better writers? You know, there's some smart things out there suggesting that this is doable. It, and this is, is in my world of language. It, it, some of the language technology is so remarkable. So for example, we now can answer, give, we, we can have a computer grade an, an essay test and grade the essays and give feedback and, and grade the test as well as the human can. Now what that means is, what, and what most classes will do is they'll have a human graded and a computer graded. And if the two disagree, they bring in another human. And what they find is when they bring in the other human, that other human agrees with the computer about as much as it does with the other human. So the point is, is we're moving in directions where this, this, this artificial agent will be able to give good feedback. Do we need human connection? Yeah, of course we need human connection. So I, it's not as though this is going to completely replace it, but it is a little creepy that a lot of the things we can learn, we don't need a, a close human supervision.
between the computer and, and, and the uh, clients too. So I think that there should be some way that we can find to build it in the uh, programming. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is where things, again, there's some awesome stuff coming out. So, uh, in fact, I just was at the University of uh, Southern California, USC, and they have a group that's where, they, where they're creating an artificial system where this avatar uh, interviews you in a, in a clinical interview. And, they, and I did it myself. I was really stunned what a good job it did. You know, and afterwards I felt great. I was thinking, yeah, this is the way to do therapy. <laughs> you don't want to hear that. And, and <laughs> there's some downsides to it. But again, it just points to this interesting world that we're moving into. Thank you.